Paul, thanks so much for joining me today in the next version of the sales leader interviews as part of our remote sales culture study. Great to have you here, Paul. I mean, for those watching this or, or reading this and hearing about you for the first time, I guess just to kick off, it'd be awesome if you could tell us a little bit about kind of your story um, at Salesforce um, and a few reflections, I guess, on, on 2020. Yeah, certainly. And thanks for having me, Matt. Hugely, um, hugely appreciate the time. Um, so yeah, as you said, my name's Paul Taos. I'm a uh, regional vice president here at Salesforce and I currently run the Revenue Cloud and Pardot organizations here in the UK. Um, I've been at Salesforce just coming up to four years now. Um, I actually started on the 31st of January, which is the last day of our fiscal year. So a, a crazy introduction to Salesforce, but one that I've um, incredibly enjoyed over the last four years and have been very, very fortunate um, to have been involved with. Um, in terms of my kind of journey, I guess I came in like a lot of people do at Salesforce as, as an AE. Um, I kind of have a background of about six, seven years of technology sales prior to joining Salesforce. And I actually came in and was responsible for selling a CPQ and billing product now known as, as Revenue Cloud, which was um, brought into the portfolio off the back of an acquisition about 18 months before. Um, and I did that for a couple of years um, with, with, with some great success uh, before eventually moving into my first leadership role, which was to run that Revenue Cloud team um, as a first line manager. And then I moved into the role that I'm in today, which took on some additional product sets in Pardot um, and at the time Quip as well, um, as a kind of multi-cloud organization um, supporting our customers with, um, with a mixture of different technologies to complement their existing CRM solution. Um, so it's been quite a ride. It's gone incredibly quickly, um, but one that I've enjoyed thoroughly throughout that time. I think 2020, you, you know, in terms of looking at some reflections, probably not gone how I thought it was going to go coming into the year, but I, I guess that's true of everybody. Um, and probably being one of the most challenging years of, of my career in terms of having to adapt overnight and also lead a team of, of people trying to do exactly that as well, whilst trying to maintain yeah. as much normality as we possibly can. So it's, yeah, it's been, um, it's been really interesting, but at the same time, I think being an amazing development opportunity to, to, to be faced with such challenges and, and trying to work out a way of overcoming them. Absolutely. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head there when you, you spoke about challenges, but the, the great feeling that you get when you, when you overcome those. I mean, looking back over the last 12 months, Paul, if you were to pick, I guess, one highlight professionally in 2020, what would that highlight be? Um, do you know what? I think watching Salesforce and the business kind of pivot to the new world that, that we find ourselves in today, not just in terms of, oh, we're now all remote working and, and we don't see each other in the office anymore or anything like that, but actually being able to maintain our relationships with our customers, being able to um, find some level of continuity in supporting our customers and supporting the projects that we were working on, despite the fact that we're no longer in our office, in customers' offices, um, and really trying to help customers through that transition as well. There was a, there was a very much a purposeful focus on our customers' well-being in light of the, the pandemic when it first hit and how we can support them through it. And you would have seen through a number of initiatives that Salesforce have run this year with Work.com and Salesforce Cares, that that was the, the primary focus for, for us as an organization as to how we can help. And then latterly, okay, now how can we get back to some level of normality? And watching this machine move in that way with all the different parts that that make it up was kind of fascinating. Um, but I guess something that I take a huge amount of pride of being part of and being involved in, um, because that, you know, it's no mean feat, but something that I think the world adapted to and Salesforce played, played a huge part in our industry, in our little world, as to trying to make that as, as seamless as we possibly could. I think that's probably my highlight. Nice. Yeah. And I guess that, you know, the, the, the Salesforce machine kind of seems to go from strength to strength. It's been an amazing journey to, to witness. Um, I guess just before we jump into the topic of today, which is around remote sales cultures, I mean, 2020 has been a, a challenging year for everyone personally. I mean, are there any personal highlights that you'd you'd like to share kind of looking back over the last 12 months? Wow. It's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? We've become so absorbed with 
what we've been kind of working with this year and the, the, the massive change. That actually, when you think about personal highlights, kind of like, what have I actually, what have I actually achieved <laughs> from a personal basis, rather than just trying to maintain normality? Um, which is an achievement in itself, right? <laughs> like maybe, yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe just trying to be as normal as possible is is my personal highlight. I think, I think for me, I'm, I'm probably someone that feeds off other other people a lot. I like being in the office. I like being in and around other members of the team and kind of bouncing ideas across my peers and and, and kind of mentors and coaches on a regular basis in person. So I think for me, I found that adjustment quite difficult. Um, whilst working from home wasn't necessarily something that was new to me it wasn't something I did on a regular basis so that was quite an adjustment so I think getting the best out of myself to kind of get up every day be motivated um kind of drive the same level of energy and enthusiasm and urgency that that I tried to do as, mm. as a leader um in light of everything that was going on was 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 probably was probably a big one for me um I think I made the transition as I mentioned in my introduction from what a first line sales director role into a second line leadership role that, that I do today so I guess that that in itself was a, was a personal highlight making making that change from a, a career perspective but it was also an opportunity not just for me but for a number of people to actually still reach mm. career goals and ambitions in in this in this world you know business doesn't stop and we didn't we certainly didn't slow down and whether that's professionally in terms of deal cycles and our engagement with customers that we're so primarily focused on but actually not taking sight off what your career development looks like and what your aspirations are and still actually reaching for those goals. And in my personal example this year, actually managing to, to achieve them. Absolutely. Really looking forward to, to unpicking some of those topics today. I mean, yeah. Paul, just to, to start thinking about your, your own team, I've been, talk us through what the, the setup of that is, is currently. I mean, how many, how many folks are you overseeing and uh, mm -hmm. what's the, the structure of the team? Yeah, so um, I look after two separate product areas um, with a mixture of, of people right the way from ESMB all the way up through to, to enterprise, um, both based here in, in kind of uh, England and, and also some over in, in Ireland as well. So I think throughout the year, I've had between 11 and 13 direct reports uh, made up of both individual contributors and, and lead, leaders as well. Um, and whilst we fall under one business unit i guess each of those teams are managed very differently the products are very different um the sales cycles and cadences are very different in terms of how we how we how we operate so i guess in in, in that respect i kind of wear two two very different hats one where i'm a first line manager to a number of aes and somewhere i'm a second line manager to to a leadership team as well so have yeah. less engagement on the day-to-day -day, but more so talking around the strategy and the structure um, as well as the standard kind of sales forecasting and, and business. So it's, it's it's two very different hats that actually, and I think we'll come on to a couple of points that we'll talk about today. It was how can we merge those two different areas that fall under one leader, um, but, at, but actually work very, very differently and independently of each other. Um, and I think that was one key observation and one key focus for me this year was to how we bring that sense of team and that sense of community uh, that regardless of what you sell or regardless of the, the the cost of product or the sales cycle or the complexity, actually, we all kind of had one goal this year, which was to maintain kind of our health, our way, our well-being and the, the, the normality that I've already spoken about. So it's probably been different to how it normally would have been. Um, but from a structural perspective, that's that's kind of um, that's my world. Yeah. And I mean, think back to, to March. I mean, I assume you, you had... Uh, a certain amount of face time in the office. Talk us yeah. through that shift to being fully remote. And then obviously you had the extra job of playing those two roles. I mean, how did that that work out for you this year? Um, I, yeah, I think like you said, when I moved into to leadership last year, I actually found myself being in the office more than I probably ever had done before. It wasn't just now myself that I needed to kind of think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And naturally I have a team of people who are quite um, spread out Across the country and therefore then being in the office was, would be quite sporadic so i try and be more consistent in how often i'd be there plus i was finding myself working with other teams and other parts of the business on a more regular basis so it would make more sense for me to be there so just as i've got into a routine of that it, the kind of shift the shift happened um and i think some people adapted to it better than others as, as you would expect some people weren't in the office a great deal anyway so for them it, it was you know limited impact 
for others, they really enjoyed like me being in the office and, and seeing people on a regular basis for both the professional advantages, but also for the social element as well. Mm. So I think when that was when that shift was enforced and we all found ourselves like we are today on, on using video platforms as a, as a way of communicating, I think I probably did what a lot of companies do, or a lot of leaders, leaders do rather, um, and went completely on the other end of the spectrum as to how much I was talking to my team, probably more so than I'd ever done before. And it's quite, I find it quite funny when I look back now, I think we were doing almost daily or every other day, hour long kind of catch ups um, and Zoom or Google Hangout calls and what have you, just to stay in touch with each other to the extent where I ended up scaling them back because people were just finding it overkill. But I kind of assume that that's what I should do. Everyone's going to be concerned. I want to make sure I'm catching up and, and checking in with everyone. So we just went on completely other end of the spectrum until I found myself talking to people more than I ever had done. Um, and some of those people would be working from home kind of on a regular basis anyway. So really probably didn't need that that much interaction with me on a day-to-day -day basis. But that's probably what I did initially. And then as it started to settle, found a bit more of a structure around what was actually necessary rather than what I felt was necessary at the time because we were all we were all learning at this point no one had really ever been through something like this before so I think I'd do things a little bit differently um but for the first time having gone through it probably did what I think most people most people did yeah and, and what is that kind of cadence that you settled on Paul with the team in terms of touch points and communications I think communication across all of these sales leaders interviews that we've done has been such a key topic and it feels yeah. like really been a, a year for sales leaders to step up and uh, communication has been key to that. What's that, that cadence like? What have you found that balance to work for, for your team? So I think, I think initially my focus purely went on the, the well-being and, and the health of, of the team as opposed to the forecast, which was always our regular cadence anyway. It was very much deal structured outside of one-to-one -one or career development uh, conversations. Um, and that kind of became completely secondary to how is everyone adapting? Is everyone okay physically, mentally? And that was the focus for probably the best part of four, five, six weeks after we first went into kind of lockdown. And then everybody started, like I said before, to settle into the, the new routine. And we started to then define, okay, how often do we need to speak? How often do you want to speak? Because everyone was different. Some people wanted a 10 minute a day to check in. Other people yeah. were happy with the once a week, hour long, and we'll cover everything from well-being through to forecasting in one call. So I think what I, what I started to do after, after those first few weeks was to just understand individually how I felt everybody was and what they were saying to me and then determining what they needed. I've never been one for um, doing a mandatory, everyone must attend every single morning. We do a daily stand-up. What are you doing for the day? I think that's necessarily my management style. So I try and maintain it as flexibly as I possibly can so that people get from me what they need rather than what I want to give them, if that, if that makes sense. So I was very heavily led by them as individuals. And I think now I don't have, to answer your original question, um, a clear and defined structure that goes across the whole mm. team other than maybe a weekly kind of weekly check-in at the start of the week. Everybody else now, it will be a case of a, a regular forecast call and then ping me when you need me. I'm happy to put 10 minutes, half an hour in at any point in time and different people use that use that option differently but I think on the whole we, we kind of give I hope I give everybody what, what they need at any one time. Nice I, what I really like about that Paul is it, it sounds like you've, you've been really employee centric about how you've gone about it and quite frankly there's different styles of salespeople, right within your team I'm sure Absolutely. it's not a one-size-fits-all solution uh, so it sounds like uh, you, you've gone in with a good approach there. I mean, you mentioned the the community word there. I mean, obviously, that's been a huge challenge this year for salespeople across the board. You know, we're we're a tight knit community. We thrive off a lot of events and human interactions. Yeah, you know, that's been taken away. I mean, just talk us through some of the the kind of challenges that that you've seen across your team, and have you had specific feedback from your team around some of these challenges? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think whilst the technology is obviously so important and so paramount in in a customer's decision making process around vendors that they engage with and that they work with i think for me personally both as a as a, as a frontline salesperson and, and also as a leader i've always put a huge onus on the relationships that i try and build with with my customers and the trust that i try and build with my customers um what's become much harder this year for i think a lot of people has been how we do that in in a virtual environment is it as easy to 
build and maintain those relationships um, online as it was when you could go and have a meal with somebody or a coffee or, or, or a meeting with somebody face to face and look somebody in the eyes across the desk and, and have a conversation. And I think that's been the biggest one for us, especially at Salesforce, where we, we are very heavy on events. You know, you only have to look at Dreamforce going 100% virtual or World Tour that we do on an annual basis. They're obviously yeah. our, our key events, but outside of that, every single individual salesperson is driving their own customer engagements on a, on a very, very regular basis. And I think that's really, really hard um, to do in a much more formal basis, which when you're kind of having to schedule time in a diary to be on a particular hangout or a, a Zoom call or whatever it might be you're using, um, you all of a sudden find yourself going into corporate mode and going by an agenda rather than having any sort of fluidity in the conversation or an interaction with a customer that you would normally have. And being able to get your personality and, that, and build that level of trust, I think becomes yeah. much more difficult. So I'm always, I think this year more than ever, um, so appreciative and so impressed by any opportunities and any projects that we're able to to sign this year because it's done so in the most challenging of circumstances 100 percent, yeah and i mean to, to your point around how active salesforce as an organization are in the event space yeah you know, i can vouch yeah. for that i remember being in silicon valley towards the, the beginning of my own startup career and hearing, you know, notorious, amazing stories about these crazy parties with <laughs> Salesforce throw with amazing guest lists. And, you know, that, that's all been taken away from us now. So I guess, you know, the relationship building side has taken a new, a new turn. Yeah, com com completely, completely agree. So I think, like I said earlier as well, in terms of how Salesforce pivoted to accommodate for not having those events this year, which play such a significant part in our, in our calendar and our events calendar um has, has been amazing i think you know salesforce have done an incredible job but it will never be the same as being in front of customers face to face whether it's at one of those marquee events or whether like i said it's a one-to-one -one over a coffee or, or a dinner or whatever it might be to actually get to know a customer and understand their challenges um in the level of detail that, that we strive to, to to hopefully provide solutions that that make their lives easier 100 percent, yeah I mean, we, we've spoken about some of the key challenges there, Paul. I mean, you know, community being one of them, communication as a leader being being a, a second one. I mean, what are the challenges have you really seen coming through your team this year? I mean, obviously you mentioned everything's been shifted later in terms of deal completion this year. Yeah. It really does feel like it's a race to the finish line yeah. uh, this month. What are some of the other challenges that you're, you've been seeing this year? I think... Um... I think giving the right level of direction when we're not necessarily going through the regular cadence that most of the salespeople have, have kind of organically um, come to follow over the course of their careers. And that might be if you're lacking in pipeline or opportunities where you'll go and create pipeline, you'll go and engage with customers, you'll set up an event, you'll, you'll, you'll ultimately pick up the phone and see what you can generate. I think the first part of this year especially um, with, with very good justification, a lot of customers didn't, didn't want to speak to us um, and we weren't the priority at that time. It was very much around them looking after their own staff and their own business, not necessarily engaging with, with vendors to talk about potential projects or things that we might have been talking about at the very beginning of the year or, or even last year. So I think for salespeople perhaps newer in their career, they probably found themselves leaning on myself and other leaders in the business for that bit more direction around what should they be doing in these circumstances. If customers aren't ready to engage with us to have conversations mm. around their projects for the year, what do they spend their time doing that ensures that they're being productive, but also not just losing ground when the situation starts to improve? And we've seen the improvement throughout the year, which is why we've now got this big race to the finish, because you know our customers have 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 adapted we've adapted and we're picking up those conversations again but there was definitely that period for the first half of the year where teams were looking for direction what do we do now rather than sit back and wait for the economy to recover or for our customers to come back online and um, what can we do to be productive in this interim and i think giving that direction even from my perspective i've, I've not been through it before so it's really an opportunity to think quite creatively and put ourselves in our customers shoes as to mm. understand where can we offer value without an a expectation that it's necessarily going to lead to, to something revenue generating. I think that's a fantastic point. I, I reflect back to kind of March, April, May time, and, you know, just a, a number of business owners network 
just figuring out how to stay alive. Um, yeah. So anything that came across as a sales conversation was literally, you know, get the hell out of here. <laughs> completely, completely. And yet it was a team of salespeople having that conversation. You know what I mean? So, you know, we're wired to qualify and to, to challenge and, and kind of find solutions. And actually at that point in time, it very genu- genuinely was, how are things going? Can we help you in any way? Um, as opposed to, like I said before, an expectation that it was going somewhere else. 100%. I mean, it, I get the sense through through a number of these conversations that, that that we've had in recent weeks with with yourself and other leaders, Paul, that it feels like 2020 has actually been a, a kind of defining moment for salespeople. And, you know, we've really had to level up, um, you know, heading into 2021. Are you, are you feeling optimistic about the experiences that you and your team have gone through and how you're thinking about tackling the next year? Yeah, with, without a doubt. I actually, I feel incredibly optimistic, not, not just because, and I, I'm by no means an expert, but not just because I think that we will begin a slow recovery of getting back to the world that we want that we once knew with with kind of the advances that we're seeing around vaccines and and the the, you know, the the various initiatives that are being run to help that happen. I think if you can be successful, if you can survive this year as a salesperson, um, you will come out of it more rounded, more experienced, um, and probably with a greater appreciation. For the fact that we're very, very fortunate to work within the industry that we work in, for work for the for the company that we work for, um, and once the world is ready, we will get back to normality. And actually, what we will have is a backlog of projects and of opportunities that actually would have come to fruition this year that have been naturally pushed back to next year and even even the year after that. But we are now in a in a perfect position. To, to hopefully start re-engaging and, and having those conversations. And, and for a lot of people, whether they've made time to sit back and go, I'm going to use this time to, to develop professionally and personally, they would have done organically anyway, just because the challenges that have been presented this year have, have enforced that. So without really realizing it, I think I've definitely got a team of people that are coming out of this year, regardless of how they performed or what their, what their end year um, attainment might be, um, actually better salespeople than they were at the start of the year. And we'll see the benefits of that in, into the long term. Oh, I love that. Well, it's uh, a really optimistic message to, to end <laughs> on. I think uh, a lot to look forward to in 2021 for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Paul, I guess the, the, the question that I've asked uh, a lot of sales leaders, and you're, you're totally biased in this one, is, um, you know, Salesforce or Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's a great question. And I... It's not being totally biased. I love, I love the concept of Star Wars, but embarrassing, never seen a Star Wars film. So for me, it has, it has to be Salesforce. <laughs> I would have been very surprised if you, uh, if you went for Star Wars. Paul, oh, I've no, really enjoyed... I, I know people who would. <laughs> <laughs> I've really enjoyed our, our conversation today, Paul. I mean, for, for, for those who, who want to check out uh, more around yourself and, and the work that you do, within Salesforce, like where can they find out more about yourself um, or the specific product lines that you oversee? Yeah, absolutely. So the Revenue Cloud and Pilot Organization that that I look after this year, please check out the Salesforce website if you'd like to learn more. Um, But feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, More than happy to answer any questions, um, but really appreciate the time with, with you today, Matt, and enjoyed the conversation a lot. So thanks ever so much. Awesome, Paul, likewise, and look forward to catching up soon. Super. Thanks, Matt.